Hi folks, hope you are okay. God bless you. Love to everybody out there. Um, let's just pray and let the Lord bless this time. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your encouragement, Lord, and we pray that you bless us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, I, I, I don't like making these videos, but I have to make the video. I'm getting tired and tired and tired and tired and tired and tired of this guy called Leighton Flowers attacking Calvinism every day. Every day this guy is attacking Calvinism every day. And there's something not quite wholesome about it. There's something not quite normal about it. Every day, every blessed day, he's attacking Calvinism. And I'm sick of it. I'm tired of it. Uh, Mr. Flowers, you're unbalanced. Why are you doing it every day? Every blessed day, you're attacking Calvinism. It's not normal. I've made maybe two, three videos on you, on you over a number of years. But you're making videos every day, every blessed day, attacking Calvinism. And I'm tired of it. I'm absolutely getting tired of it. So without further ado, he's, he's talking about Calvinism and apologetics, that Calvinism apologetics fails. So let, let's just uh, listen to a little bit of what he says. He's saying, I'm not willing to go there. It, it, it's, it's exactly what... Um, Roger Olson was talking about with uh, Michael Horton, a Calvinist friend of his, and they were having that debate, and somebody was saying, you know, you talk about God being monstrous on Calvinism, and this, and he's kind of critiquing him, and, 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 and Roger Olson, Dr. Olson, to his credit, was saying, listen, I'm not trying to say that, that my Calvinist friend, Michael Horton, believes God's monstrous and, and, and teaches that God's monstrous. I'm just saying to you, I can't get there. I, I, my, my, my mind, whatever, maybe God determined my mind to be this way, whatever it is, I cannot surrender my sense-making. I cannot give my children over on the pyre God bless uh, you, Elijah. and, and God bless still you, choose to worship a God who I believed would be that way. I, I can't choose to give my allegiance to a God that I believe would do those kinds of things. I, in other words, if I became a Calvinist, I would have to believe God's monstrous, and therefore I can't adopt Calvinism. And I reject Calvinism because I believe the logical ends of the system leads to a monstrous view of God. And that's the point we're trying to make is that we're not trying to say, at least I'm not, that because you're a Calvinist, therefore you believe God's monstrous and you don't care about your children and all these kinds of crazy things that people can come out and make it sound like we're, we're accusing you of. What we're trying to say is that consider the, the possibility that your interpretation of those three major texts are wrong. Or just even Romans 9, for goodness sake. If Romans 9 doesn't teach Calvinism, then you have no apologetic for Calvinism. You really don't. Let's just be frank about it. Uh, Mr. Leighton Flowers, you don't know what you're talking about. You, honestly, you don't know what you're talking about. You just said that if you can't bring Romans 9 into the, into the picture, your Calvinism is null and void. We're going to show you, I'm going to show you in a minute, tons of scripture that talk about God is sovereign, God has a plan, etc., there's tons of scripture about God's sovereignty and about his decrees and his plans. So to say that if you can't use Roman 9, your Calvinism is null and void, to be quite frank, is, is complete ignorance. Complete ignorance. And so if you just have a wrong interpretation, think about what kind of view of God you've asked the world to adopt. Even Calvinists like Piper and, and Sproul and others describe how difficult this pill is. The whole concept of double predestination, reprobation, the whole concept of God uh, unilaterally making choices to condemn or to save people before they even do anything bad. Um, all of those kinds of issues, all those superlapsarian controversies, all that come along with it, all of that baggage, all of that hard, difficult stuff is, is what's packed into this, this systematic way of thinking. What if it's wrong? Ask yourself that. What if it? The issue is not about emotion. Uh, the emotion is uh, if, children, if if young people go to hell, and it was decreed by God and all the rest. It, that all of this is a. It's either emotion, or b. It's trying to go beyond what Scripture says. 
when you're attacking Calvinism, you're either responding in an emotional way or you are going beyond what Scripture says. Because if you love the Lord Jesus Christ and you love the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, you humble yourself and you submit to Scripture. And it's what the Scripture says. It's not what my emotions think. It's not what my logic thinks. It's what Scripture says. It's what Scripture says. And I humble myself, and I hope you humble yourself, to the Scripture. So Mr. Flowers is playing on people's emotion about people, uh, children burning in hell and all the rest, which we'll, we'll, we'll get to. Um, we will get to. <laughs> but let's just hear what he has to say. We'll give him his Ask yourself that. What if it's wrong? What if I've interpreted this passage wrong? And think about the damage it's doing for these people who are the average layperson, the average person out there looking in to the window of Christianity and going, What's in here? Let, let me seek this out. Let me figure this out. Let me understand this. I want to. I want to figure these truths out. I want to know what this religion is saying versus this. Religion. The the damage that you're doing is this: is the there is only two types of theology, a theology that's God centered or a theology that's man centered, and your theology is man centered. It's all. It is better to have a theology that's God-centered rather than man-centered. Atheists are saying versus these Christian authors, and they're peeking into our world, and they're seeing your depiction of Christianity, your depiction of God, as ultimately choosing to reprobate babies before they do anything bad, and all the things that you've heard said by Joe here. And, and they're peeking in, and they're going, Ugh. Reprobate babies. Are you serious? Are you serious? Are you serious, Mr. Flowers? You're using an emotional argument that is not necessarily co connected with Calvinism. Uh, there are different views on, on, on the what happens to babies. So what, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? You're using an emotional argument, bro, to get brownie points for your position. And you're straw manning Calvinism. You're straw manning Calvinism, that the, the imply that the, there is uh, the babies go to hell and, it, and it's been ordained. Where do you get that from? Where do you get the, the about the babies? It, there are different views. Read Charles Hodge, read, read R.L. Dabney. There are different views on that. To say that this is Calvinism is a straw man argument. Man, Mormonism does look pretty good compared to that. That's a disgraceful oh, yeah. statement. No, Allah. Well, kind of looks similar on some forms of Muslim teaching. And I don't want to have How can it. it look similar when the Calvinist is all about Christ, is all about justification by faith, is all about the deity of Christ? How can you compare Calvinism to the same as Islam? Uh, to be honest, I think you're blasphemous, bro. I think you are blasphemous. Mike W., God bless you, bro. I think you're blasphemous in your attitude towards the Reformed faith. It's blasphemy, period. Blasphemy. Complete, utter blasphemy. Comparing the biblical God to the Islamic God is total blasphemy. That. In other words, if free will is true and you're wrong, folks, think about what you're doing to people. You're dissuading them from our God. And so that's what I'm just saying. Boy, uh, how, how do you get that? Jesus talked about he chose people. And yet he stood over Jerusalem and said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how have I longed to gather you? Yeah. But at the same time, Jesus said, you've not chosen me, but.
Your straw man in Calvinism, sorry, it keeps blanking out a little bit. Totally straw man in Calvinism. Make sure you're right about this. Because if you happen to have interpreted Romans 9 wrongly, and there are numerous, even among the Reformed tradition, interpretations of Romans 9, in other words, it's not a cut and dry doctrine as, as much as people like to paint it as, could you be wrong? And how is that affecting your evangelism and your apologetics? And how is it affecting the way the world sees Christ? That's what you have to ask yourself. Both of those things can be true at the same time. But also, I need to provide them with a worldview that provides an intelligent basis for things like logic and reasonable thought and giving them some sort of order to their world. And in an atheist worldview... I don't think telling your children that they are garbage, that they are worthless, that they are deserving of nothing but torture and death is good for them. I think and that yet, is very damaging. And yet that is what the atheists purport. So how is that any better than what we say? Is it an atheist position that that children should be tortured? Where in the atheist view is there a torture chamber for children? So notice what he's forced to do here. He's like, well, yeah. So basically, uh, that was a, that was a, an emotional argument by the atheist saying that oh, you, your God tortures children. Number one, um, we're talking about infinite things of God. You've got to be, you know, you've got to stick with the scriptures. What do the scriptures teach? Where do you find in this in the scripture? Right, that's number one. Number two, the atheist uh, they don't believe that there's right and wrong. So why are you saying that? torturing children or whatever is wrong anyway not that that's what calvinism teaches i mean this is ridiculous um I, 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 but the whole point of this video of, of flowers and it'll go off a minute on the video and my video and it'll come back so so be patient with me please but the whole point brothers and sisters is that he's attacking the calvinistic apologetic now if you read cornelius van til Cornelius Van Til developed presuppositional apologetics. He, 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 people ask questions and he answered those questions. Flower says that presuppositional apologetics or Calvinistic apologetics shuts people down, doesn't let people ask questions. You go and do research with, with Cornelius Van Til and that's complete nonsense. Van Til would take students for coffee and answer their questions. Greg Vanson often took questions in classes and in his debates and lectures. So that's a terrible indictment that Flowers has made in one of his videos that presuppositional apologetics, Calvinist apologetics, that it shuts down questions. Yes, there are some that have, have done that. There are some that have used it that way, but that's not, that's not the way it was developed and that's not what it's all about. Uh, presuppositional, presuppositional apologetics is, is about sh comparing worldviews with different worldviews and, and, and bringing in tag or the, the tag argument, which is looking at uh, the logic and things like that, how you can account for these things. It's a very powerful apologetic. Now, this atheist that this other Calvinist was talking to and, and Flowers was critiquing, the atheist uh, is, is saying things that they don't even have a right to say. They don't have a right to say that something's right or wrong because they don't believe in morality. I heard John Mike. God bless you, bro. Mike and Elijah. So the idea that presuppositional apologetics is, is, is shuts people down, doesn't allow people to ask questions, is nonsense. Some do do that, but that's not original presuppositional apologetics developed by Cornelius Van Til. The man who founded that method of apologetic took people, took students for coffee and answered their questions. And people who developed that presuppositional apologetic, like Greg Banson, also took questions and answered people and didn't just shut people down. So it's a complete red herring, a complete 
utter red herring and a complete indictment, a complete indictment of Mr. Flowers for saying such disgusting things about pres presuppositional apologetics. I'm disgusted that he would say things like that. And, and complete ignorance, complete and utter ignorance of presuppositional apologetics as absolute disgrace. Having said that, having said that, having said that, we now come to the issue of predestination. This is a topic that we have to, Flowers is ex, exploiting something that requires humility. A lot of what he says is, is, is emotional arguments. It's not really based on exegesis. And he's hiding the fact that he's using logic. He's always using logic. He's always using log log logic. His methodology, what he calls provisionism, which is like really Pelagianism, really, uh, is, is, is using logic. He's, 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 he's not being honest with you. And a lot of people who follow him and a lot of people who go down his line, you're not following the Bible. You've already got doubts about God, doubts about the Bible. And so when he comes along and he's using logic and you take him to it, you take on his ideas and tap into it because you're using logic. You say, oh, no, I want my God to be a loving God. I want my God to be a loving God. I can't believe in a God who is sovereign like this. Mm, okay okay but it's all about you you want a god of your image oh he's got to be a loving god yeah yeah god is love the bible says god is love but you want god to be loving yes okay and so now your logic you're using your logic when you're looking at bible text so anything anything that goes against your logic you you wipe away you say no i can't accept that and so you end up actually going down the path of secularism you end up moving away from orthodoxy you end up moving away from the bible and then these examples where he shows calvinists become atheist they were never saved anyway if you were really born again and really saved you will not leave the faith you'll not abandon it and become an atheist how can you become an atheist when you've tasted jesus how can you become an atheist when you know the king of kings and lord of lords Ridiculous, ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. So here's the 1689 confession based on the Westminster Confession. Compare the Islamic God to this. How can flowers compare this God to Islamic God? Listen, the Lord our God is one and only living true God. Whose substances are in and of himself, who is infinite in being and perfection, whose essence cannot be comprehended, who is most pure, invisible, without body parts or passion, who only has immortality, who dwells in the light which no man can approach, who is immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, in every way infinite, most holy, most wise, most free, most absolute, who works all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most glorious will, for his own glory, who is most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, who forgives iniquity, and who, who is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, and who at the time is most just, terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, who will by no means clear the guilty. A God having all life, glory, goodness, blessedness, and from himself is unique, being all-sufficient, both in himself and to himself, not standing in need of any creature which he had made, nor deriving in glory, any glory from such. On the contrary, it is God who manifests his own glory in them and through them, to them and upon them. He is the only founding, fountain of all being from whom, through whom, and to whom all things exist and move. He has completely sovereign dominion over all creatures to do through them and for them and to them whatever he pleases. In his sight, all things are open, manifest. His knowledge is infinite, infallible, and not dependent on any creature. Therefore, nothing is for him contingent or uncertain. He is most holy in all his counsels, in all his work, in all his commands to him is due from angels and, and men 
whatever worship, service, and obedience they owe as a creature to the Creator, whatever else He is pleased to require of them. In this divine and infinite being, there are three substances. The Father, the Word, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all are in substance, power, and eternity, each having the whole divine essence, yet this essence, yet this essence being undivided. The Father was not derived from any other being. He was neither brought into being, nor did he issue from any other being. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. All three are infinite without beginning and are therefore only one God who is not to be divided in nature and being um, but distinguished by several peculiar relative properties and also their personal relations. This doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and our comfortable dependence on Him. So how can you compare a Trinitarian beautiful God from Scripture here and say that Calvinist God is the same as Islamic God disgrace and shame on you brother if you are a brother because the way you're going you're blasphemous and heretical in the way your statement how can you compare that to islam you cannot not in any shape or form can you compare that beautiful statement about who god is to the islamic god they are completely two different different entities one is the true and living god the other is a pagan manifestation The, the second the third point that I so I've made on the yes ah Stephen yes okay but the issue is here let's put that yeah but Stephen okay Stephen yes okay I understand but you can't just isolate one aspect when you're talking about God you take the all totality of the nature of God when you start talking about theology. And so you can't straw man a person's position and say, oh, the Calvinists believe in predestination and it's the same as the Islamic God and not forget and not leave out. And you can't leave out that the Calvinist is Trinitarian and you can't leave out all these different attributes of God that the Calvinist believes and then lump all that on the issue of predestination to Islam, you can't do that. It's not fair. It's a straw man argument, brother. Okay, it's a straw man argument. It's misleading the public. He should say, oh, the Calvinists believe in the Trinity. The Calvinists believe in all these doctrines of who God is, but I disagree with them. Their doctrine of predestination is the same as Islam, which is questionable. That's very, very questionable. Very, very questionable. Okay. Can you compare the Westminster Confession statement on divine decrees the same as any Islamic statement? I don't think you can. I don't think you can, Stephen. I don't think you can, my friend. And there are different camps in Calvinism about divine decrees and about predestination as well. So be careful you don't strong man a certain position so bring the totality of the doctrine of God. Don't straw man the Calvinist position and say, oh, the Calvinists believe in the pre double predestination. Oh, do they? Some do. Some don't. What about the Westminster Confession? What about the 1689 Confession? What do they say? What do they? What does the Belgic Confession say? Let's read these. Because if you read them, mm, mm, well, you're going to find something quite different from what Mr. Flowers is saying about Calvinism. Okay? What, what, what Mr. Flowers is doing is self-projection. He's got a view of Calvinism that he understands and that it's formed on his logic. It's, a, it's on a logical basis that if God is sovereign, he's preordained everything, therefore man has no free will, therefore ma people are being sent to hell, and, and he's using that logic, right? And But you've got to be careful with logic because, yes, God is, you know, look, look at Judas. It was ordained before the beginning of time about Judas. But is, is did it did God make Judas do what he did, or did Judas do what he did? Did God make Judas do what he did, or did Judas do what he did? But it was already ordained. Jesus said that this guy, it's already been ordained about him. But it was him who did it. 
In Psalm 22, it was already ordained, it was already decreed, it was already stated that they would be casting lots for Jesus' garments before it even happened. It's not a foresight. It's not God seeing it foresight. No, it's God decreeing. They will cast lots. They cast lots for my garments. And what happened? They cast lots for the garments. Now, did God make them cast lots for the garments? For Jesus' garments? No. But in Psalm 22, it was already ordained. And what about Jesus' death? Isaiah 53, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. In Zechariah, they pierced my hands. Hmm? He come riding on a donkey. Hmm? Was, was Jesus' death ordained of God? Was Jesus' death decreed? Was it? Was it? The answer, you know it is, yes. But did God force Pontius Pilate to do that? Did God force the high priest to, 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 to throw Jesus to the wall? Did, did, did God force Pilate to do what he did? Did God force the Roman soldiers to whip Jesus? Did God force the, the Roman soldiers to put a thorn on his head? Thorns on his head? Did God force the, the nails on the cross? In, in, uh, the, the, the Romans to put the nails in the cross? Did he force them? No. But was it ordained? Was it going to happen? Yes. What do you learn from that? You learn scriptures bigger than your brain. That's what you learn. And if you want to push logic, you want to move into logic, you go where flowers is going. You go all over the place. You go where some even Calvinists go in a wrong, wrong place. They go all over the place sometimes. If you push logic too hard, it was ordained before the beginning of time that Jesus would die upon the cross. And yet, Pilate did what he did. You say, well, how, how does that work logically? I don't know. I don't have to work it out logically. You see, when you're talking about God, you're talking about an infinite God who uses what we call analogical language. He brings, he brings himself down to our level so we can understand. Now, listen, imagine you are trying to teach astrophysics to an ant, a little ant, right? So you got a little ant and it's you're stood up and you're looking down to the little ant, right? Just for argument's sake, you're, you're going to try and communicate astrophysics to this little ant. Do you think the ant's going to fully understand what you're saying? You're going to have to reduce your knowledge to a very, very simple way of understanding. And that ant, if it starts asking questions, you say, no, it's not logical. It doesn't make sense. I mean, I'm just for argument's sake. I mean, ants can't think like us but just if if they could right the ant would be thinking i don't fully understand it's a bit illogical and and yeah do you think it's wise for that ant to start questioning you when you're teaching it astrophysics you you're trying to help the ant you're giving a language that they can engage in you're going down to the level but it's unwise of the ant to start moving in its own logic and think it knows better than you and so God in his great power and mercy has given us a Bible, has given us the word of God, but we're ants. And that's the problem with Mr. Flowers. He doesn't realize we are ants. And because we are ants, woe betide us if we start moving into logic and thinking we know better than God. And that's his problem. His problem is, he thinks he knows better than God. You say, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 no. Mr. Flowers, he wants a God of love. A God. Listen, when you start talking about God, there are going to be questions that can't be answered. Even if we took one, even if we agreed with Mr. Flowers, let's imagine we agreed with Mr. Flowers and went with Mr. Flowers 100%. He would still have questions himself that he can't answer so oh god is love and and god has fr gives us free will okay so let's imagine your mr flowers has got a son of 12 years of age and he tells him the gospel tells him and he says oh my god wants my 12 year old son to be saved 
Oh, and my God's a God of love. Okay, okay. Let's go with Mr. Flowers. Let's go with him. Don't believe in predestination. Okay, we'll go with you, Mr. Flowers. Now, here's the kicker, bro. You s imagine your son doesn't believe. And imagine your son dies. What now? Now you've got some big questions, haven't you? Is God just for sending that boy to hell? Is that boy in hell? Some big questions for you, bro. So you don't get out of these tough questions to straw man Calvinism as if you get out of qu big questions. It's nonsense, absolute nonsense. What you're doing is blasphemous. You're attacking the living God is blasphemous. And number two, you're causing division amongst believers when you shouldn't be causing division. And number three, you're leading people into heresy. You're not leading people into Arminianism. Which I would say is a distortion of, of, of true Christianity. You are leading them into farther, deeper, deadlier waters. You're leading people into a very, very ultra man centered theology that ultimately will lead to secularization because the people that follow you are using the logic, they're not using the Bible. They think they're using the Bible, but there are whole rafts of scripture that are ignoring. Because they can't swallow what God is saying. Because they can't humble themselves before scripture. So let's see what scriptures. Um, what scriptures. They are ignoring. Let, let's turn to uh, Luke 6.13. Luke 6.13. It says in Luke 13, when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose 12, whom also he named apostles. So there's an example that God chooses. He chose 12 disciples, okay? God can choose, okay? Number one, God elects his people. He chose his people. Number two, he calls them. Through it, the Holy Spirit. Number three, he regenerates them through the new birth. Number four, he justifies them. Number five, he adopts them. Number six, he sanctifies them. Number eight, he, he perseveres. He, he, he gives them perseverance. Number nine, he saves them from death. When they die, they'll be resurrected. Steve, so did God decree... So did God decree the devil? Steve, the ultimately, brother, let, let's, let, let, let's look at uh, Adam and Eve and let's look at Job. When, when Satan came to, to, uh, to God in the book of Job, Satan couldn't do anything unless God allowed it. And it was all, and the life of Job was in the plan of God. All that happened to Job was in the plan of God. So the answer is that God has decreed everything. There's, we're going to get into that. There's not one flower. There's not one bit that has not been decreed by God. But God is good. We cannot say that there is evil in God. And how he decrees everything, we can't fully understand it. But to say that even one flower is out of the will of God is to say that God is not in control. So to your answer to your question is, the devil was in control by God. God did not make the devil do it, but God had the plan. There was a plan involved in what uh, Satan did. But how it works and why, and it doesn't imply evil in God at all, because God is higher than your thoughts and my thoughts. And that's where it comes about faith and trusting God. So I hope that answers your question. The problem stated, throughout history of the Christian church, there has been much controversy over the doctrine of election and predestination. This is due to the fact that these doctrines, so we'll get onto that a bit more, uh, Stephen, but it's a good question, brother.
Well, here's a question for you, Steve. Does God know everything? Does God know everything? So when, before even Satan knew, made his move, did not God know about it beforehand? That's a question for you, Steve. If he didn't know about it beforehand, it's not God. Throughout the history of the Christian church, there has been much controversy over the doctrines of election and predestination. This is due to the fact that these doctrines raise profound questions both about the justice and love of God and the nature of man's freedom. Some Christians are opposed to some of the teachings we believe to be biblical, which are respect, uh, expressed in this chapter, particularly the view of election precedes foreknowledge, and that man will is not free because of his bondage both to sin and to Satan. They hold a contrary view for the reasons set out below. The fall. Although man is a sinner, he is not helpless, slave of sin and Satan. He is able to respond to God's grace, having free will to accept or reject God's offer of salvation. Faith. Man has the ability both to desire and to receive saving faith through the grace of the Holy Spirit, who strives to persuade all men to believe the gospel. Foreknowledge. Because God is omniscient, he knows precisely all that will happen in the future. Foreknowledge simply means that God foresees the faith of all those who will believe and be saved. Predestination. God then predestines to salvation all those whom he foreknew would accept his salvation. Destined, destination and election are the result of God's foreknowledge. Election. God chooses those whom he knows will one day respond to him and his salvation. So the, these are the opposite view of Calvinism. These are the opposite view of Calvinism. So man has free will, God foresees, God chooses when you choose him, okay? And Christ died for all. Many verses in the New Testament is made to, uh, so the idea that Christ died for all means that some people reject Calvinism because it's talking about God elects people. So Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me all you who labor and heavy laden and I will give you rest. 1 Timothy 2, 4 who desire all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Titus 2.11 2 Peter 3.9 Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. These scriptures are what stop people believing in Calvinism, that there's a universal desire and call of God for all people to be saved. Some but Christians believe that the expression all men referred to these verses means the whole world, and therefore everyone is eligible for salvation upon repentance and faith in Christ without further qualification. So, here's the question. And if this is answered, you're a Calvinist. Do you choose God or has God chosen you? When you came to be saved, was it God that chose you or did you choose God? So let's turn to uh, Genesis 12. Turn to Genesis uh, 12. Verse 1 to 3. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. God chose Abraham. God chose Abraham. He didn't choose someone in, in Nineveh. He didn't choose someone in South America or China. He chose Abraham. He chose Abraham. God is a choosing God. God is a choosing God. Oh, God can't choose. He can't choose. Did he have to choose everybody to be a patriarch? 
Did he choose everybody to be a patriarch? No, he chose Abraham. He chose Abraham. Now, let's turn to Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7. So we're building a doctrine that God chooses. Deuteronomy 7. When you, 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 you people who are married, why didn't you marry everybody? Why didn't you do equal opportunity and marry everybody? No, you chose your wife. You chose your husband. So God chooses. God chooses. When you go into a restaurant, you don't eat all the food. You choose the food. Yeah? Can't God choose? Doesn't God have a right to choose? Uh, Deuteronomy 7, 6 and 8. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6 and 8. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep his oath, which he has sworn unto your fathers, that the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God chose the people of Israel. God chooses. Oh, God, we, we want a God of love. And he's got to love everybody. But in the Old Testament, he didn't choose all the nations. He didn't choose China, he didn't choose India, he didn't choose Britain, <coughs> he didn't choose the Roman Empire, he didn't choose the, the Persian Empire, he didn't choose South America, he didn't choose Brazil, he didn't choose Philippines, he didn't choose Japan, he didn't choose the Egyptians, he chose his people. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people for you were the fewest of all. But because the Lord loved you, he chose them because he decided to set his love on them. They were the poorest, the weakest of people in the world and in his full grace in his full love electing love he chose the people of israel and modern people say no 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 mr flowers i no 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 i don't like that it's a monstrous god blasphemous total blasphemy it's a monstrous god i don't agree with it you don't agree with it because you're not submitting your heart and mind to scripture. God chose the people of Israel. And from your argument, why doesn't he choose all the nations? But doesn't it not say in Jonah that he cares about other nations? Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because he was proud of the people of Israel. And he was proud of, of, of preaching to the people of Israel. Yes, God. God chose Israel, but he cared about Nineveh, but he didn't choose all the nations. He didn't choose all the nations. That's what your God, you think, should have done. No, he chose the people of Israel. He has a right to choose. He has a right to choose. Uh, turn to um, Isaiah 42 1. Isaiah 42 1. So we've not even used Romans 9. We're not even used Romans 9. We've just been in the Old Testament. Isaiah 42 1. Isaiah uh, 42 1. 
Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. The Messiah was elected, chosen to be the Messiah. The Son of God, chosen to come down to be the Messiah. So Abraham was chosen. The people of Israel were chosen. And the Messiah was chosen. God is a choosing God. He's a choosing God. What, what, why, why didn't he choose another nation? Why Israel? He has a right to choose who he wants. Why did he choose Abraham and not somebody else? He has a right to choose who he wants. Why did he choose the Son of God to come and become the Messiah? He has a right to choose who he wants. He has a right to do that. Do you disagree with him? Don't you think it was a good plan that God had to call Abraham? Don't you think it was a good plan that he called the people of Israel? Don't you think it was a good plan that he called the Messiah? So where's your logic going to go now? You're going to question the plan of God to call Abraham? You're going to question the, question the plan of God that he called Israel? You're going to question, question the plan of God that he called the Messiah? Do you see where your logic goes if you start questioning God? You fly away from the true and living God of Scripture. God is a choosing God. That's the Old Testament. Matthew 24, 31. Matthew uh, 24, 31. Get your scriptures out. Get your Bible out. Matthew 24, uh, 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together. Oh, 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 let's go again. Let's go again. Let's go again. Matthew 24, 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather to get there his elect from the four winds of the, of the end of heavens to the other. The elect, the chosen ones. You gather his elect. He's not gathering everybody else. He's gathering his elect. You want to come with your logic. You want to come with, oh, God's to love everybody. But scripture says he gathers his elect. Acts 9, 15. Acts 9, 15. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Paul was chosen of God. Paul didn't choose someone else. He chose, uh, sorry, God didn't choose someone else. He chose Paul to be the main missionary to the Gentiles. God is a choosing God. Romans 9, 10 and 12. Romans chapter 9. Now we're in Romans 9. Romans 9. Verse 10 to 12. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As is written, Jacob have I loved, but Uso have I hated. What shall then we say? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and have compassion on whom I will have compassion. A plain reading of that text is for the children being not yet born. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, It was said of her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it written, Jacob have I loved, but Uso have I hated. 
What it's saying there is that God elected Jacob and not Esau, and they hadn't done anything. Before they were even born, God chose Jacob. You can dance around it all you want, say it's all about Israel, whatever. You still get to the point where God has made a choice. So even if you try to skirt around it, try to get out of it, it's all about God made a choice, an electing choice. It's that simple. Um, 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 verse 26 uh, and 29 for you see your calling brethren how that not many wise men are after the flesh nor many mighty nor nor many noble are called, but God has chosen. Mm. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. You, when you got saved, you were chosen because you were the weak things of the world. And God chose you to show his glory. God is a choosing God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But how does this work with my logic? I don't know, but this is what scripture says. 2 Thessalonians, so we're showing clearly that God chooses. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 and 29. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Two Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13 but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you brethren beloved of the Lord because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and of truth 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13 but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you brethren beloved of the Lord because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification. God from the beginning chose you. 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 You can't get any plainer than that. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9. What about those verses? He says he wants everyone to repent. Yeah, I accept that verse. But do you accept 2 Thessalonians 2.13. Do you accept that? <laughs> 2 Timothy, you can't just throw it out and say, I don't agree with it or twist it. It's a simple, plain scripture that God chose you. God chose us. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief of the truth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9. Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. Oh dear. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given in Christ Jesus before the world began. Before the world began, he called you that's what the verse is saying before the world began he called you 2 timothy chapter 1 verse 9 1 peter chapter 1 verse 2 1 peter uh, chapter 1 verse 2 elect oh according to the foreknowledge that's love beforehand of god the father through sanctification of the spirit and to obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, peace be multiplied. Elect. Calls them elect. Revelation 17, 8. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel. Those names are not written in the book of life. From the foundation of the world. From the foundation of the world, there was people who were written in the book of life.
In the Gospel of John, we have a glimpse of both aspects of the mystery of election, the human and the divine. The disciples were confident that when Jesus called them to follow him, it was they who had made the final choice, whether it be his disciples or not. At the beginning, some of them said, we have found the Messiah in John 1, 41 and 45, really believing that they had chosen to follow him and not the other way around. But towards the end of his ministry, Jesus said to them without any qualification, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. John 15, 16 is as clear as day. John 15, 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. It's as clear as day. I'm going to put the link here. Maybe someone wants to come on. There's the link if anybody wants to come on. So, I mean, that's a beautiful scripture. As clear as day. John 15. So when you're saying that the Calvinist God is like the Islamic God, shame on you. John 15, 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. It's as plain as plain as day election there. These verses show us that the mystery of God's plan of redemption, he chose us in Christ before the world began. Ephesians 1, 4. Another plain scripture. You see, Mr. Flowers wants to ignore these scriptures or highly logicalize them and argue them away. You can't do that. Ephesians 1, 4. According, he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy without blame before him in love. You can't get plainer than that. For Mr. Flowers to say that if you can't get your argument from Romans 9, you have no case for Calvinism. What a total, absolute nonsense. Just look at Ephesians 1.4. According, he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Clear as day, the doctrine of election. His own purpose and grace which he had given us in Christ Jesus before time began. 2 Timothy 1.9. In order to begin to understand election, we have to go back in time before the creation of the world and accept that God's, that God's own purpose and grace began for us when he chose us in him, in Christ, in the distant past before we were born. This indeed is a mystery. The words we need to remember are his own purpose and grace given us in Christ before time began. So when Satan was tempting Adam, God had a plan, already had a plan about your salvation and bringing you home for his purpose. Ephesians, excuse me, I get tired. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepare hand that we should walk in them. So before the beginning of time, God had already prepared the opportunities for you to do good. The father gives to Christ is a showing that God chooses. The father gives us to Christ. Christ said that he was the good shepherd in John 10, 11 and 14, who came to give his life for the sheep. How can a person become one of his sheep? Only if the Father gives him to Christ. Do we realize that we came to Christ because God the Father gave us to him before the foundation of the world? Before the foundation of the world, the Father gave you to Christ. You don't believe it? Turn to John chapter 6, 37 and 39. All that the Father gives me will come to me. 
and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. John 6, 37, 39. John 10, 28, 29. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any one snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Jesus gives them eternal life. Jesus draws the people. Uh, sorry, the Father draws them to salvation. Go with that. But that means Eve didn't have a choice to eat of the fruit condemning all creation. You see, now, Steve, you're doing logic. Bro, you're doing logic. Look, let's look at the logic that you're doing. God has, we know, here's the biblical data. Stephen, here's the biblical data. God chose us before the beginning of time. Biblical data. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. That's the biblical data. God chose us before the beginning of time. There was already a plan. Right? Even our good works was worked out. Even our salvation was all worked out. There was a plan. Okay? There was a plan. So when Satan did whatever he did, there was a plan to it. When Adam and Eve did what they did, there was a plan to it. God had a plan. Right? Now, that's biblical data. Right? Next biblical data. Satan tempts Eve. Biblical data. We know that. Yeah? Next biblical data. Eve eats the fruit. So biblical data, God has a plan. For our salvation, God has a plan even for our good works. It's all worked out, right? The fall, everything. Jesus coming, it's all been worked out. The plan, it's been decreed, right? Boom, right? That's the that's the biblical data. Biblical data, Satan, the serpent, in the serpent, tempts Eve. Biblical data, Eve ate the fruit. Biblical data, the plan. Biblical data, Satan tempts Eve eats the fruit biblical data just look okay okay all right i hear what you're saying but just just go with me just go with me a minute biblical data god has a plan biblical data the serpent tempts Yeah, yeah, we'll get we'll get we'll get to that in a minute. Hello, Sam. Hello. Hello, how are you doing? How are you doing? You okay? I can hardly hear you, bro. Oh, uh, can you hear me a bit better now? Can you hear me a bit better now? Just to check. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, nice beautiful. to see you, bro. Nice to see you too. How is uh Ghana? Are you are you doing okay? Yeah, yeah, we're okay, mate. We're okay, bro. Oh, good, good, good. Now, before I jump on, Zed, I've been, I've been, I've been defending Calvinism a lot recently. I've noticed there are a lot of people who have a bee in their body <laughs> for it. Yeah, you know I mean, like, uh, and I think, I think it's because they don't understand really what the sort of reformed Calvinist position is. You know, like, um, like one thing I get accused of is we, we believe, you know. Uh, God forced Eve to eat the fruit. It doesn't quite work like that. While God knew it was going to happen, Eve still made the choice of that. Because God still yeah, judges people yeah. for the choices. But it doesn't mean God didn't know said choices were going to happen. Yeah, yeah. I was. It's nice to see you, Sam, anyway, bro. And it's I good to see you okay. too, man. Oh, I'm good. Uh, I'm good. I just uh, thought, thought I'd jump on. Is that this... Uh, recently, I was in Speaker's Corner on Sunday, and there was one guy who refused to talk to me, just because I was a Calvinist, by the way. No other reason mm. than that. <laughs> so I've noticed people have a bee in their bonnet for it right at the moment. Anyway, you continue. I think you had a thought. I, I was just you, saying so that if someone says God made Eve eat the tree, eat the fruit, I was just saying what the problem with flowers, a lot of people who were criticizing Calvinism, 
is rather than just to stick to what the scriptures say, they want to they want to get it all nice and logically fine. So if if God has a plan for our salvation and a plan um, to uh, even for our own good works, like He's already ordained, and then under here uh, Satan tempts, and then Eve eats the fruit. It was it was Eve that ate the fruit. God didn't make her eat the fruit, and, and but they would say, well, wait a minute, if there's this plan. Then he must have made Eve eat the fruit. And so they, they, they're trying to bridge the gap with logic. And then and then they say, oh, Calvinism is monstrous and all that. Where, where um, you know, when you read the Westminster Confession, you read the 1689 Confession, they're, they're very cautious in, 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 and, and wise in what they're saying about these issues that we have to be careful, you know, yeah, the one, so, the one thing they point out brilliantly in those confessions is how Adam and Eve actually had genuine free will up until the moment they fell. And that yeah. fallen state is passed on to all of us. And so all of us don't necessarily have free will as a result of uh, Adam and Eve's decision. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just read a couple of scriptures. I'll let you comment on, on, on them. Um, John six forty four. No one comes to me unless the Father draws him. John, I'll just read the King James there. John uh, 644. Uh, it says, uh, No one can come to me except the Father which had sent me draw him. Sent, sorry, no man can come to me except the Father which had sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Any thoughts on that verse, uh, Sam? Uh, well, I guess I'm imagine you're going to go to the other one that I'm thinking of in in the Gospel of John, <laughs> but Christ makes it very clear that um, one no one no one comes to the Father. Um, sorry, that who uh, the Father gives Christ, that no that uh, no uh, harm shall befall them, at least in a salvific sense. So, <clears throat> if we are given if if you were given to Christ by the Father, what does that imply that we are chosen? Yeah, yeah. And and you know, like the difference between eisegesis and exegesis, if you read that whole chapter, so we read uh, verse 44, but it's peppered with these uh, these chosen motifs, these chosen ideas, because you go back to uh, verse 37 all that the father give me shall come to me and him that come to me i will in no wise cast out so chapter six is peppered it's those are two examples but it's peppered with this uh, idea that uh, of, of choosing that the you know um and so like when people look at these scriptures they can try to do eisegesis and get around it but if you read the whole chapter uh it's as clear as day um John six forty five. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught of God. Every man therefore have heard, and have learned of the Father, cometh unto me. So again, would you agree that that's saying that unless they're drawn by God, by the Holy Spirit, that they cannot know God? Yeah, exactly. Like um, in, if you like, from a Calvinist point of view, in our fallen state, we are incapable of tru truly choosing God. That it's through, uh, it is through the grace of God that we come to know God and we are born again via those means. So, Mr. Flowers, I don't know if you listen to Mr. Flowers or you know much about Mr. Flowers. Yes, I do. <laughs> I get sent his videos a lot by a lot of people who don't like the he, fact I'm a Calvinist. So, <laughs> His main contention, uh, last I think it's today, he was live today, but his main contention is, that uh, reformed apologetics uh, is no good uh, because of this, because of election and things like that. And I was, uh, I was just saying at the beginning that uh, one. He's also made a statement in one video where he said presuppositional apologetics. It stops. Uh, they use they use it to. It's just used to stop people asking questions. Now I, I mentioned uh, early on in the video that some some modern presenters on youtube have used it in that way but when it was developed by van till and and um 
and uh, people like Ban Greg, Greg Banson after him. Uh, Van Til would take students um, for a coffee. He'd go street preaching and then he'd take, so he's a professor of apologetics, he'd go street preaching. If someone engaged with him, he'd take them for a coffee and he'd let them ask questions. The same with Van Til, uh, the same with Greg Banson. Um, but do you, would you, in your understanding now of your growing and studying the institutes and the things that you've been studying, um, does it help? Do you think, is Calvinism a hindrance to apologetics or have, have you found that it's uh, uh, helped you in apologetics better? It, it's, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, it's helped because I think also what you do is you give, you give, god his rights and his true glory as well like um because one thing i think that's misunderstood by people like Leighton flowers is that if you like the presupposition that a reformed person starts with is that god is genuinely all sovereign and god is genuinely all knowing and then obviously we start to map out um the theology based on based on that like, um, but obviously also I think it enables you to read the scripture more honestly. So when you hit a, a pretty explicit passage like Romans 9, for argument's sake, you can, you can read that passage in, in, light of what, in light of what you understand about God. There are some things I think in the Reformed tradition we'll never truly understand, and that's okay. But, yeah, yeah. but, but the one thing that we understand is that... Uh, through the sovereignty of God, we also understand how merciful God is, actually. Because um, one hard pill to swallow, I think, for a lot of Christians, and I've started to say this a bit more now, is that God would be completely just in a lot of ways in condemning humanity to hell, like all of us to hell. He'd be completely mm -hmm. just in doing so because God, God, because God demands utter perfection. However, he hasn't done that. He has chosen people to be with him in heaven so that actually displays the true mercy of god so um if you've listened oh sam's gone uh Veco, god bless you brother it's good to see you i think maybe it might be sam's internet maybe you come back um sam if you do come back great if you don't come back i hope you're okay bro it's great to have you on Veco, you're welcome to come on bro oh sam's back I pressed I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> Predetermined, bro. You'd be off for a minute. It was, it was predestined. Uh, <laughs> there we so, go. So so um from your knowledge of Leighton Flowers, what 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 what's your uh cr critique or thinking concerning his critique of uh of Calvinism? Like I don't know if you've seen the debate he, recently with James White and things like that. I did see that debate with James White, and I'd say Leighton Flowers is mainly very emotive, if you know what I mean by that. He's trying, yeah. he, he, he doesn't want, um, and this is my critique of say, well, well Armenians are very much my brother, brothers and sisters in Christ, like, you know, they, of course yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. But, but um, the critique I do have of the Armenian position is you want God to be something that he's not. Do you know what I mean? Like, and you want God to, fit into your kind of paradigm whereas sadly the what sadly the scripture is kind of not on your side here when i watched uh, that debate between flowers and white and i'm not one of james white's biggest fans by the way but but i will say that james white's case was thoroughly uh constructed from the scriptures whereas i would say flowers wasn't flowers was just mainly philosophical and trying to make out that Calvinists make out God to be some sort of evil dictator uh, rather than rather than what God truly is which is sovereign loving and merciful yeah I, correct me if I'm wrong uh, Sam you know my, my my understanding of the debate when I was watching I might be incorrect so if you, you can feel free to correct me is that um, what I what I was seeing or understanding is that James White was expounding John 6, looking at doing the exegesis, expounding the text. And what I, what I, I think I saw, I might be incorrect, but it seemed to be that Flowers was going all over the place, like all over the scripture, trying every trick in the book, using 
kind of emotive language about babies and things like that. Uh, and it was just like going all over the place. It was not really an exegesis. The debate was supposedly an exegesis of Roman uh, John 6. John 6, 44, I think it was. Or, um, and yet it seemed to be all over the place. I don't know if that's what it, you saw. I, I, yeah, that's kind of what I saw. Like um, Flowers was trying to avoid all the clear passages that say that God chose us or predestined us. Um, he was trying to avoid those. He went to the more hard passages, like, for, say, from a Calvinist perspective to deal with, like that one in Matthew where, you know, at long have long I wanted to gather you like a hen gathers her chick, chicks, but you were not willing. He was trying to go to passages like that. Um, but also ma majority of his arguments were, were emotionally based, really. He's basically trying to say, like, how do you believe God could be this? How do you believe God could be that? But the thing is, I don't think he actually understands what at least the classical reformed position is there are some people online these days who pass themselves off as calvinists and they're what you would call hyper calvinists i would i would say like you know mm. super lapsarians and all that kind of thing yeah, um yeah. and i but i would say they misrepresent classical uh calvinism what classical calvinism is yes we believe that god you know has decreed all things and predetermines all things but that doesn't mean also he's purely responsible for, say, anything bad that happens to you. While we would be openly say God had a role to play in that, <laughs> um, we'd also mm. say there is still choices that are being made based on the person's <clears throat> own will, basically. Mm. Admittedly, we don't believe in li free will in the cla in like libertarian pro free will. Yeah, we reject that. But, but, but we yeah. don't reject the idea that people can make choices. We don't reject that at all because yeah. that's what yeah, God judges you for. Correct me if I'm wrong. So, like, people are responsible for their actions. It's not, yeah, God has predestined and He has a plan. But if you, you slap someone in the face, <laughs> you did that. You made that choice. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's great. That's all. That's great. Some great thoughts there. So, so here's a question: Why do you think He keeps going on about it every day? It's nearly every day. It does me head in. Because, like, Same, yeah. I don't watch. I don't watch Him every day. I, I kind of just every now and again in your feed, it's something pops up on YouTube, and I, I guess, to, yeah. Sorry, go on. No, sorry, go on. So, I interrupted. So, you. so today it just popped up, and he's, I thought, there he goes again. And you look at his videos; it's like nearly every day. Calvinism, Calvinism is monstrous. God, Calvinism, this, and that, and I'm thinking, give it a break, mate. Give it a break. It's not only that; it's just more. If he had like legitimate criticisms of Calvinism that's fair enough but it feels like he's taking it to the extent where I wonder whether he views us as Christians or not because obviously he's an Arminian so I would view him as a Christian personally but yeah but it's like you've got the same problem with uh Sam Shimon as well you know like yeah. uh and his critiques of Calvinism because like he once again would say that Armenians are Christians but not Calvinists and I think they just misunderstand what we believe <laughs> that's it, it comes down to that like they they tend to straw man the calvinist belief and the calvinist position on on things yes we believe god is all sovereign yes we believe god had a plan from eternity past but does that therefore mean that humanity is not also responsible for its own choices no it doesn't we do still believe god judges people for the choices that they made that's the important mm. distinction like um and i keep trying to say to people now because i get a lot of people who who like uh, you know sort of judge me on base solely based on the fact I'm I'm reformed. I'm like, you guys need you guys need to actually learn what a Calvinist believes before you start making outright claims like this. And I think it's because it's a theology that's being, I like I said before, I think it's a theology that's being abused by some people online, who like kind of give themselves the reformed tag. Do you know what I mean? But they're not really reformed in the sense of they don't even they don't understand what the reform position is what calvinism is like yeah amen amen i'm, I'm going to read this uh, by gideon boots like if you want to just comment it and he says hello brothers the more i listen to arminians the more i'm convinced that emotions don't want to accept who god has actually revealed himself to be rather than submitting to his sovereignty mm -hmm. any thoughts there bro it, it, well, it's true because a lot of people are uncomfortable with the idea that God can play it, 
play a, such a direct role in one's salvation. I think people, I think, I think people like the idea that your salvation is somewhat in your own hands a little bit. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like um, you have some control over it. Um, because obviously, as a, as for the reform position is kind of no, you don't really have control over it. God's either chosen you, or he hasn't. But but um, and I think people are uncomfortable with that thought. That's what I've always I've started to realize. They can't bear the idea that that God might have chosen you or not chosen you. Yeah, I, you know, I think you think the same as me. Like when we talk about Calvinism and Arminism. Would you agree with me? I mean, you could disagree, but for me, um, I try not, when, when I've been doing street preaching or evangelism on the streets and I meet Christians, uh, I don't say, oh, you can't join me unless you're a Calvinist. As long oh, as you I totally agree. Totally agree you, with that. <laughs> so long as you alter the fundamentals of the faith, uh, the basics will, will stand together. So if you're an Arminian, I don't, I, I don't look at, I don't, and I think you might be the same. Is we, if, I, if I see you, I don't, I don't put a label on your head and say you're an Arminian. You're a believer. You love the Lord. Uh, but in, um, but if it comes to theological debates, uh, and we're talking about different theology, you might use Arminian. But like in my in my experience, as Gideon Boots says, I, I do think a lot of people who, who are believers who who, who look at things in that perspective i do think gideon is correct in that that they they can't accept god is sovereign they can't accept that that the god of the bible the way it's described they 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 still got some of their own idea that they i think you've mentioned it in this stream that they try to pull god to this this paradigm that they've got in their own head that maybe they picked up through life or what they think about god but when they hit the real scriptures, the scriptures that are there, um, they find it difficult to accept. So I agree with what Gideon, in my experience in talking to many people about it, that's what I found is that they resist Ephesians 1.4 like as if it's a pariah. <laughs> it's like, it's the word of God. So it's sweet, it's beautiful, it's God's word. Amen to that. I I agree with you, by the way. Yeah, I'm only, I'm only a Calvinist if some if someone starts attacking Calvinism. Do you get me? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Same here, like, bro. I don't I don't really go out of my way to. I've 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 only made this. I've made three videos on 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 flowers. Over the last year and a half, I think I, I, it's like I'm not like out, pushing and attacking the different views on this, on election and things like that but because he keeps going on about it just from time to time it, just make a video maybe one or two people might see it and be blessed by it um, no that's no that's good it's but like obviously i think it's important christians of all of all sort of uh theological backgrounds you know we are christians before we're anything else but obviously if someone attacks your your sort of theological position then yeah you can stand up for that and damn i've had to do a lot of that recently um because um it's weird i found like um when i was in speaker's corner on sunday i spoke to that guy uncle sam it's me i went with uh john you know or bloodfire whatever you want to refer to him as. yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah and um we were after all the ecumenicalists that was our goal i spoke to uncle sam and the minute he found out i was a calvinist he spoke about me in worse terms and he was Roman Catholics that we were talking about. <laughs> so he mm. seemed to have a bigger bee in his bonnet for me being a Calvinist than a Roman Catholic. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, because he, all of a sudden he wanted me to defend the tulip and stuff like this or, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I was like, I wasn't having it. I was like, no, because you and me, uh, you and me fundamentally have, have the same yeah, gospel yeah, fundamentally. Yeah. So this shouldn't even be an issue. <laughs> but, like, but I think, uh, yeah. You know what I mean? sorry bro go on no i'm just saying you get what i mean i was that's why i didn't defend it because i was like you and me fundamentally have the same gospel so i don't see why this is an issue like did i mean yeah. like uh not at all and, and there's a time and a place for that isn't there there's you know there's the, you're, you're exercising maturity to start an argument like that 
in that context, it's immaturity from his part. He's not being mature, you know. Um, and I think a lot of people on this topic, I mean, the confessions warn about this. He can, warns about the, the need to to be mature in, in discussing these topics. It's, it's not something to just willy-nilly start diving into. You, you've got to be willing to humble yourself and willing to listen and willing to discuss in a, in a right way. And what I found is... Um, there's a lot of prejudice in people towards Calvinism. Uh, to, to the believers, Christians, uh, they're, they're, they're very prejudiced. So that even ministries like uh, on YouTube, like, or uh, if you're going to get involved with us, you're a Calvinist. So uh, you know we're we're not too happy about that. Like, I'm thinking, wait a minute, you you believe in justification by faith? I believe in justification by faith. You believe in inerrancy? I believe in inerrancy. You believe in the deity of Christ. I believe in the deity of Christ. Why can't we do a stream together? But because you think I'm a Calvinist, uh, because I'm a Calvinist, you, you're a bit wary about it. It really annoys me because it's a lack of maturity there. It's a lack of maturity. Yeah, it's like John. John's not a Calvinist, and yet me and him have been doing ministry together. Like he has, uh, he has Calvinist sympathies, if you like, but he's not actually a Calvinist. Yeah, yeah like, uh, yeah. like. Um, and I remember Uncle Sam was trying to play me and John off against each other. Me and John were having none of it though. But we, but he was like, so you're you. It was like, so he's a Calvinist. Are you a Calvinist? And John just goes, No, I'm not a Calvinist. But I understand why he believes what he believes, and it's fine. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like um, you know, and the point is, is like, me and John know fundamentally we both believe the same things it's that simple we it's just essentially it's like a different methodology of getting to those same conclusions that's what it comes down to um so you know what I mean? you know what i mean by a different methodology don't you like as in we could we draw the same conclusions in the end just have a yeah, different way yeah, of getting yeah, there yeah 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 I, I say i saw a stream the other day you and you and uh John, is it John or John? Do I just John? Uh, just John, John, really? Yeah, yeah. You see, it's a good, good team. It was a good, good stream. Um. So, I, I'll just go one or two more scriptures just to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, uh open the heart. So Acts sixteen fourteen. Acts sixteen fourteen. I'm going through scripture because maybe one or two people might come on here, and then if we go through scripture, maybe they, it will convince them to be a bit more mature in the debates and discussions. Um, no, of course. Acts sixteen sixteen fourteen. And a certain woman named Lydia, if you want to read it, just say, bro, you know. No, 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 it's fine. You read, you read it, Jason. You've started. Acts 16, 14. A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of of Paul. Why do you think this is relevant to our discussion? Well, it says how the Lord opened her heart not that she opened her heart but the lord opened her heart there's obviously yeah. um the reform position again is that only the only god can soften your heart uh to him because um obviously we'd say because of the original sin and uh how simple humankind is that it's only through god's grace that your heart can be softened and opened to him amen bro amen uh, Romans eight twenty nine to thirty. Oh, the golden chain of redemption, right? <laughs> I, uh, Sam, I, I, it might be just my computer, but no, it's some... it, my my mic's not the best at the moment, so you're not the only one, Jace. I said the golden chain of redemption. <laughs> yeah, amen. <laughs> Romans eight twenty nine to thirty. Um, says. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who were called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, 
he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, they also glorified. Do you want to say anything on that? <laughs> this is base. This is basically the Calvinist idea of predestination in a nutshell. These this collection of verses, especially the last one, because um, you know, moreover, whom he predestined, he is also called. Whom he's called, he's also justified, and whom he's justified, he's also glorified. So he's talking about the process that God that God goes through into saving an individual, you know, like um, predestines us first and then calls us, then justifies us and then finally glorifies us. Amen, bro. And I mean, you know, uh, in your journey and your studies of growing in Christ and, and whatever, you, uh, and the same with me, like for me, over the years, especially being a missionary, and, and I've been over the six years, I've, I've taught nearly some some days. It's like week after week, every day teaching, and a lot of it is teaching various courses like uh, Stuart Olliot Back to Basics, which is uh, teaching youth that and people. And in that, there's a there's a section on the God sovereignty. So I've often gone over this sovereignty teaching about God is sovereign, and the more you understand that God is sovereign, the more sweet the faith is, the more your faith is strengthened. I mean, would you agree with that, bro? Yeah, I would, because it also gives you more personal assurance in your salvation as well. Because I think, <clears throat> and I, I'm, I'm not speaking for the Armenians here, I'm just simply saying this is how I would imagine it would feel sometimes but you'd be looking inwardly to yourself to know if you are saved or not whereas whereas with um from our perspective you don't have to look inwardly you only look to god and the promises that god makes mm -hmm. amen bro. and uh, john mack and uh, gideon anytime you want to post scripture just put the scriptures i'll put them up some great thought there sam as well um See what that next scripture is. Uh, well, we, we'll go to uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. Could I add one, being as we were in the book yeah, of Romans? Yeah, of course not. Can we, can we do Romans 9? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you know oh. where I'm going to go with that. I think you know where I would, I, where I would go with that. <laughs> yeah, go. Oh, uh, yeah. Are you, are you, you going to read it? You read it. Yeah, you read yeah, it? I'll read. yeah, I'll read it. I'll start in verse 14. That's where I like to start. Um, okay. But I'll read the whole section because it, so it, I feel like it exegetes itself, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, what shall we say then? Is there any unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For what he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then, is it not him who wills, nor him who runs, but of God who shows mercy? For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I've raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all of the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whomever he wills, <clears throat> and, he, and whom he wills he hardens. You will say then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you? <clears throat> to reply against God. Will the thing formed say to who formed it, why have you made me thus? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honour and another for dishonour? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath predestined for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which have been prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not only, not the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. <laughs> What's your thoughts on Romans 9, Jason? Jason? <laughs> wow, well, when you were reading it, I was getting blessed, bro. Um, wow. 
to it, it's as plain as day is that God is sovereign and he is he, he's, he's electing grace is there for those whom he he wants to give it to and those who he doesn't want to give it to he doesn't have to give it to and he's not unrighteous in that that like you said at the beginning if God wanted to take everybody to hell he was just in doing that he doesn't have to save anybody so I think the passage is saying that God doesn't have to save anybody but in his grace he saves some people and it's as plain as day in the passage um, and it's teaching that God, God has the final say. It's not man. So, yeah, because Paul, Paul points it out pretty explicitly that um, it's not based on human will or, or exertion. It's based purely on God. Like, um, and uh, yeah, it's a pretty. This is a. This is this is the passage that made me consider the Reformed faith. Believe it or not, Romans nine. That's why I have a soft spot for it. Oh, but wow. um but um it makes it evidently clear that also god like it references with pharaoh god raised up pharaoh so that he might show his power in pharaoh but not yeah. necessarily with the intention of saving pharaoh but that doesn't make god unjust like paul points out like um you know but paul does it simply points out like who are we to answer against god and that is something mm -hmm. that i feel like people have to keep in mind it's like you just said yeah I, I, like i said earlier it's a hard pill to swallow but no one and and to be honest this was i think this was the hardest pill for me to swallow but when you do swallow it it's kind of it makes god even more loving to you absolutely no one deserves heaven we all deserve hell mm -hmm. like um so the fact that God bestows his mercy upon people actually shows how loving God actually is. Mm, amen. I just want to say hi to Richard. He's a chaplain uh, to the prisons in Ghana. So God bless you, Richard. Pastor Richard. God bless you, bro. God bless. Yeah, I think I think uh, you're sharing there, brother. Um, I think that psychologically... Well, I look at my own history and my own history of studying the Bible and theology. I think as the starting off as a young Christian, I would read these passage a passage like that, and it would trouble me, and I would find it difficult to like accept it. But that's because the mind is still got worldly ideas, or is resting. You're resting on your mind and not a scripture. But if you really submit to scripture, and allow the Holy Spirit to teach you. And once you accept this, God becomes sweeter. He becomes greater. Your your love for God grows stronger. Uh, your assurance grows stronger because you're, you're not rooting any of your theology in man anymore. It's completely and totally in God. And if, if, if you believe in God and you trust in his sovereignty, you can trust him. There might be questions that you don't understand. There might be difficulties that you might not comprehend. But if you believe in such a God who is sovereign, who elects, you can rest in such a God, knowing that everything is going to be okay. That's why it says that beautiful scripture there, and it says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to, to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. But if you believe a God doesn't know the future, or a God who is guessing the future, or a God doesn't have a fault, plan for the future what kind of assurance have you got you're it's only looking like... in you're only looking to yourself then like like whereas in our shoes you're you're looking purely to god you're not looking to yourself yeah yeah um we'll just read one or two more scriptures and then I, i've got a question to ask you uh if you could unpack it yeah you yeah, could sure. just read uh, a couple of more scriptures i think we've we've pretty laid a good case out for election predestination um ephesians and god's sovereignty ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 and 6 having predestined us to adoption as sons by jesus christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of his glory and of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved Amen. So do you want to 
just commentate on that how, how that might be relevant to our discussion <laughs> it is because it talks about how um we are predestined into jesus christ so god the father has uh, predestined us into adoption into his son jesus christ but according but here's the important parts it's according to the good pleasure of god and to god's will and to god's glory so there was the there was a quote once from whitfield i read not so long ago which said god is glorified in your glorification but he is also glorified in your destruction and and so um that might sound a bit harsh in its own way as well but you've got to recognize that everything that god does is for his glory not for ours i think sometimes as humans we like to put ourselves on a pedestal and what the reform tradition is kind of doing is saying no we are, we don't have a pedestal the pedestal is purely god's amen amen well now i've been going now an hour and 40 minutes and uh but i've got here this book that I've been using, I just get uh, the, these scriptures, this scripture here, 1 Peter 1, 2. But I've got loads of scripture here, but I, I'm going to um, leave it now because I've got like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 pages of other scriptures. I'll just tell you the topics that we could have covered. The actual Greek word for predestination, how it's used in the Old Testament, the New Testament. Prophecy, how prophecy, uh, things are prophesied beforehand, showing you that the future is already determined. Um, looking at objections to predestination. Um, looking at the call of God um, about how we're dead in trespasses and how God calls us. Um, loads of scriptures on that. And then looking at various difficulties that people might have. We could have all we could have done all those topics, but because this topic is particularly on apologetics, Flowers' objection to Calvinism not being helpful in apologetics, you go to Speaker's Corner, you meet an atheist, you meet a Muslim. How does your reformed faith help you to deal with the atheist and the Muslim? Over it to helps. You, so, in regards to the atheist, because I guess both people. I would give a slightly different answer in regards to the atheist it's like um one objection atheists tend to have against theists of any description is the idea that god can learn things or the idea that god might be making it up as he go as he goes along whereas obviously from my position that's not possible <laughs> god's already decided things and so that makes more logical and consistent sense to an atheist and they might be able to compatibilize that better um in regards in regards though to the muslim i feel like it's just because my understanding of the bible is a bit more holistic but also i can level them a little bit because they sort of have they kind of have a slightly i'll admit warped it's very warped but a a kind of calvinistic view of god in their own way as much as they try to hide it <laughs> like um like um it's very warped but still um but i guess it's just having that assurance in my mind that because obviously I'm no hyper Calvinist. I think that God can use me to talk to people to save them, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And so, for all I know, through through God's providence, I might. I'll give you another example. I went on a rule stream not so long ago when he was talking about Roman Catholicism. And what are the chances of this, right? I met a Catholic who's from the same area as me. And so, and so, uh, and I just randomly decided to go on the stream last minute. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I didn't yeah. even know that guy was on there. Do you know wow. what I mean? Like, um, and so we've been meeting up recently, swapping notes on the reform face slash Catholicism. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's wow. like, I honestly think like through God's providence, I met this guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like he literally, he li literally lives like 10 minutes away from me. I like what, what are the, well, I don't really believe in chance anymore, but you get what I'm trying to say. Like, what are the chances of that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you know, um but but yeah, I guess it get, just gives me assurance and it also gives me encouragement, I guess. I'm not scared of like defending Christianity anymore, like at all. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> I guess that's the best answer I can give you, really. It's hard to explain, but it helps me in regards to that assurance, really. I think that for for me, like in apologetics, the reformed faith is is has helped me over the years. Like I've 
been kind of reformed like Calvinist for like, I don't know, 29, 30 years. And in those years, there's been many movements. I mean, I don't know if you remember this movement, but there was, um, what was it called? Uh, oh, oh. Uh, it was in Canada. It started in Canada where they were saying there's people got gold teeth and things like that. Uh, and people were making chicken noises and saying it was of God. And it spread to UK and it went in churches in UK. And there are all these different movements that have come and gone. gone. But the reform phase help you, it keeps you steady, it keeps you grounded in the word. Um, and when I was at seminary, uh, I was at the Nazarene College. And um, we had, uh, like, because uh, in the Reformed faith, there's a, a rich intellectual tradition. So, for example, in, in Old Testament studies, you have uh, um, William Green. You have some great, great scholars in, in that, the Old Testament, um, things like that. So, like, in Old Testament lectures, the, the Dr. Swanson was using the Valhausen hypotheses. And so I said to him, why are you using the Valhausen hypotheses? It's not. It's in a crisis. He says, oh, we have to use it because we've got nothing else. But it, it, the Reformed faith helped me to penetrate a lot of these at seminary when we're getting a lot of criticism of the Bible. It helped me to be able to, like, sift, this is good, this is bad, how to deal with this bad stuff, how to deal with that bad stuff. So it equips you, it gives you a theological base, and there's a rich intellectual tradition there that you can draw from, like um, Old Testament studies, you got uh, William Green, um, systematic theology. You got people like Calvin. You've got Turretin. You've got uh, Charles Hodge. You've got Herman Bavink. You've got Voss. You got a rich tradition, and then in various different uh, areas of theology, uh, like on predestination, different theology. There's so much a rich heritage there that you can draw on. So when you're doing apologetics. You've got a lot of resources there to, to read and study, to help you deal with people, uh, movements and questions and challenges. Not all perfect, blind spots in every any, any theological grouping, but there's a rich heritage there, that, and a lot of it is solid and helpful. Uh, oh, it for defi me, I definitely is, though, because when we went through the period of, like, the sort of Protestant scholastic period, period if you know what i mean where the protestants really yeah, started yeah. writing down their beliefs the um the group who by far did it the best were the reformed camp like the sort of the presbyterians the dutch reformed uh the swiss reformed etc you know they they wrote great sort of like you know uh confessions and tomes and books and all sorts on um on the beliefs of the of the reformed tradition they, they really they really went went for it and so yeah you're right there is such a great richness of history and of theology for us to tap into there's there's tons of it i'm not not saying you can't use others uh other resources and think there's other good resources but for, for me it's just it's helped me to keep keep on the right track because there's so many movements and waves coming and going and um just just purchase reform systematic theology volume two is, is that who, who is that gideon brooks boots is that uh charles hodge is that charles hodge that probably is charles hodge okay okay i'd imagine um, yeah. so it doesn't hinder uh it it doesn't as long as your attitude's right there are some people who claim to be reformed or do reformed apologetics and i think sometimes their attitude can hinder their effectiveness but if you are humble and you use these things in a humble way um it can be a help it can be yeah because like i said earlier there, there are people um there are people out there who give themselves the reformed tag but they're not really reformed are they <laughs> yeah i mean well, like uh, like and they kind of misrepresent and i think this is where the kind of hatred for calvinism has come from they sort those sort of people misrepresent what calvinism is and what it teaches and it's yeah. people and then it's people like you and me who end up having to pick up the pieces of that <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean. and 
And I think if your theology doesn't make you loving, if it's not humbling you, you see, when you, when you read the Puritans, when you read Thomas Watson or John Owen, uh, or you read Spurgeon or even Lloyd-Jones, these were humble people. I mean, Lloyd-Jones was very humble. For example, an example was there was a guy who, who wanted to commit suicide. He couldn't get, he couldn't believe that God has a love for him. And um, he was a believer, but he was like mentally like, quite damaged and uh, so he Lloyd Jones is 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 pastor in a church of thousands of people but every week he let this guy come to the vestry and he went over the scriptures Romans 5 and Romans 8 about God's love with him and and helped the guy to come out of this this kind of depression that he was in and very patient you know he's not saying oh I'm busy I'm Lloyd Jones I'm going to America to preach I'm preaching at Westminster Seminary he had time for people when he was humble. Um, uh, so, like, if your theology doesn't humble you and it doesn't make you, you're not more growing in Christ-likeness, you know, and, and people are not going to like what I'm saying. <laughs> They're not going to like what I'm saying, but I've been involved in reform circles for 30 years, different conferences and things. And I think sometimes some reform can be, it can be more scholastic in the sense that it's head knowledge and it's not gotten down to the heart. Uh, Spurgeon, about Spurgeon once said, uh, and I agree with him on this one, Spurgeon once said, there is enough dust on some of your Bibles to be able to write damnation with your fingers. <laughs> right. <laughs> And, um, and but what I think he's hinting at is the head knowledge is great. The scholasticism is great. But if you're not rooted in the word of God, then, um, you know, that that is where the arrogance will creep in because the word of God will humble you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I can definitely, I don't know, Paul um, Smiley, do you know him? Have you heard of him, bro? I, I haven't personally, no. No, I can definitely recommend Gideon Boots. Joel Beakey is one of my favorites. His books are superb. To me, he is the quintessential reform pastor. He, he is sound, but he is experimental. He, he preaches with warmth. He's down to word. He's loving. I've, I've actually seen him in, in UK. He came once at, uh, I think it was the Westminster Conference many, many years ago. So he's a very humble man, very loving but very, very, uh, very, very strong in, in theology. Uh, he's very good. Joe Beakey, anything by Beakey is worth worth his weight in gold, bro. So I recommend him, bro. I recommend, I haven't kept my camera off because my hair's not the best, but like um, this guy, Herman Bavink. Herman Bavink? Yeah, uh, so, because, because um, to be fair, the Dutch Reformed have truly come out with some you know some great sort of scholastic works to explain the reformed tradition but what is nice about Babink is it's a very spiritual work as well you know yeah, and, yeah. He, and he encourages you to stay close to god basically it'd be a simple way to put it when i was at um when i was at uh i did four years at Naz nazarene college and i did another that was um degree it was a degree and theology and pastoral studies but I, I did two ma's i didn't finish them i did one ma uh at luther king house and i had to move somewhere to help work with the methodist so i couldn't finish it so i didn't get the ma then some years later i came again i did another ma at luther king house and i didn't finish that because i got sick i became ill but in in i encouraged them to get some reform books and they they ordered Bavink's Reform Dogmatics, so I was able to take it out of the library, four volumes. And I remember reading it, and I, I felt like it was such a blessing because it it's simple to read. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. If you, if you disagree, you could correct me. But to me, it was very simple to read, solid, full of scripture, very spiritual, like very, very spiritual, brought you into the presence of God but yet very comprehensive academically. So he would tackle uh, any particular view 
that encroached on 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 the Bible. So he was happy to look at psychology, happy to look at Kant, happy to look at Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodox. But he did it in a very simple, very spiritual, very scriptural, but yet very scholarly way. So it had everything. So that, so that's I'd my memory. I'd second everything. I'd second everything you said. It's like, you know, there's a time and a place to be scholastic, if you like. But um, but he keeps it very grounded, does Bubbing. That's that's the beauty of his writing. You know, like he's very grounded in God and he's very grounded in the scripture and he, he doesn't lose sight of that. Whereas, say, someone like Burkhoff, well, Burkhoff is he's good. Like I'm not I'm not gonna knock Burkhoff, I'm just saying, but he is he's too scholastic. Does that make sense? It's like reading yeah, yeah. it's like reading Re sandpaper. Reading <laughs> Burkhoff's like chewing concrete, isn't it? Yeah, it's like reading sandpaper. Like <laughs> like <laughs> sandpaper for your eyes but like um it's not easy reading yeah totally agree yeah so i'm just saying that's on the opposite end of the spectrum if you like <laughs> yeah they, some people have said in the past that burkhoff is a modern the modern uh rendition of bavink but I, I don't think you can compare the two bavink is is much more easier reading and even more scholarly and yet more spiritual i think it's I think I think the Burkhoff should be used more as a reference book. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Anyway, before I go, Jason, this is a good question for you, because this is an accusation I've had thrown at me a lot recently. And I'll tell you what my answer has been to it. I'm just wondering what your answer would be to it. It'd be like, oh, you know, you got, you know, as a Calvinist, all you're doing is just following John Calvin. You know, that that's all you're doing. <laughs> I'm like, no, well, no, I follow the scripture. I might have agreed with the lines that Calvin drew, but but fundamentally calvin's authority was the bible and so every point calvin ever made was from the bible but then not only that i was like you are aware that this view existed before calvin even saint thomas aquinas i found out in his summer theologia yeah, yeah, yeah. talk talks about predestination in fact he talks about double predestination does thomas aquinas um or uh, augustine of hippo like clearly teaches uh, predestination so you can't lay all the blame at calvin's door he's not the first guy to have to have drawn those lines drawn those conclusions <laughs> i just think that when someone what what my conclusion is is obviously the bible is what gives us predestination none of these men do but when you but when someone studies the bible long and hard enough especially on those hard passages those are the lines and those are the conclusions that you'll be forced to come to that's what i've been saying but what would you say to something like that yeah well i think i think there's a couple of issues there one is a uh, fake news misinformation and the other one is uh, is ignorance about creeds and confessions so like i would agree with you i, I watched the stream that you were john on and i heard john mentioned i think you were agreeing with him that john was saying you know the confessions uh it's not we don't follow the confessions or confessions because it says it it has to be in line with scripture so so to say that you follow calvin or we follow calvin because of calvin um it's just uh if anybody says that there's it's fake news or it's complete ignorance because as you know we follow scripture so we're not interested in what man says it's what what scripture is calvin's just a man just follow scripture no nobody i think john all said it i think you agreed with him or you were on the show uh we don't follow uh any man it's what's in the scripture so that's the first thing but the other issue the big issue in our modern times is this postmodernism, individualism we um there's so much individualism in in modernity now that there's a move it's moved away from the church and the creeds um and you know so people are, are making their own doctrine what they think what their opinion is whatever and the and the idea of holding to a creed has, has gone virtually from many churches and many christians which is completely wrong because if you look at the christians of the reformation or even the christians before like early church like the nicene creed the chalcedon creed uh, the, in the Reformation, you had these creeds um, because it was an expression of what the church believed. 
But now, we'll, you know, you look at the 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 Puritans. You you look at the battles that that these these uh, people had over in the time of Bloody Mary, Elizabeth the First, um, James the First. The, the theological battles and how they had to write the creeds to say, say this is what we believe as a church, and how, like for example, the, how the Westminster Confession was formed, how the church got together, the churches and hammered out these doctrines. And it was an expression of the church. But today, uh, we're theological uh, ants compared to these giants. It's all about individualism. And so... Uh, they... I, I feel like that comes from... Uh, sorry for interrupting. I just... While this walks yeah. my head. But I feel like that kind of comes from also... Um, uh, Protestants have taken what Soda Scriptura is a little bit too far like in the sense of it's now become them and their bible under a tree the whole point of sola scriptura was not that the church is not important or even tradition is not important it's just all of that must submit to the bible that was the point you know like we can correct tradition and even creeds and stuff under the lens of scripture we can do that but it doesn't mean these things are invaluable it doesn't mean these things are not important and i feel like a lot of modern christians are like chucking all that history out the window if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree, Bible under a tree, but like Presbyterianism, for example, even the Church of England, even Methodism, had the, they had a creed. Even, you know, they, there was an emphasis in, in, in centuries past to, that the creed was important, the creeds were important to as an expression of the church. Um, and for, we can debate about uh the different influences but where we're at now where we're at now is the vast majority of processes are, are more like you're saying more, more individualist and they they they're not connected to any historical flow or any creed they just make it up as they go along with their bible and that is not true processism Pro, true processism is um, yeah, sola scriptura, but it, it was theological. It was Protestantism wasn't just about individualism. It was theological about what the church actually believes, and there were creeds made in the Protestant churches. So they protested, but they protested, yeah, we believe in sola scriptura, but here's our protest on justification. Here's what we believe. Here's what we believe on the deity of Christ. Here's what we believe on the fall of man, the will of man, decrees. And so they had the creeds, which was what the church has always had. Going back to Nicaea, Chalcedon, the church has always had creeds, sustaining of their faith. But today, uh, the post in like the Enlightenment, where it was individualism, uh, deformed uh, Protestantism with Bible under a tree, me and my Bible under a tree, the rise of Pentecostalism with, with all this emotionalism, uh, the rise of postmodernism, like there's no white one view, the rise of a lack of commitment to doctrine amongst the evangelicals, a rise of ecumenicalism, where it says we can all get together. All these have come to blur the lines of Protestantism, where true Protestantism with the creeds are not even known within within evangelical circles today you know a lot of baptist churches a lot of presbyterian churches a lot of evangelical independent evangelical churches they don't even know they, they're not rooted really in the creeds they it's just lip service and, and, may, uh, I add, and so, may i add to what you're saying because i've just had a thought actually i think yeah. one of the reasons why a lot of people are going over to say catholicism and especially eastern orthodoxy i'm not sure if you've noticed but i've started yeah, to realize yeah. that's actually quite on the rise eastern orthodoxy in a big way at the yeah. moment and i think one of the reasons for that is actually because uh the protestants have lost the idea that the church does actually have some authority that authority is admittedly from the scripture that's where the church gets its authority from but the point is, is that the church does actually have authority and the church can teach you. The church can write creeds. The church can write confessions. It can do all these things. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It's just through the lens of scripture. That's all sola scriptura is. It's always through the lens of scripture. And I think because Protestantism has lost that, a lot of people are going 
to say the Eastern Orthodox Church, especially at the moment, because to be honest, I think Francis is doing a good enough job at destroying Catholicism than you and me ever could. <laughs> but um, but the point is, is that they're doing that because they, I think they do like the note of authority that those churches contain yeah, within yeah. them. And I, I agree. And I, Lloyd Jones said, he said one of the problems with like the 1960s and early 1950s and 60s with evangelicals uh, in in UK is we lack, he said, a doctrine of the church in terms of like, uh, and I think um, the, you're right, there's an attraction to uh, Eastern Orthodoxy and, and Roman Catholicism in some cases is that people are tired of the individualism as well. Me, 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 I, I, I. They want to be part of something where it's uh, more of a body type thing. They want to be uh, part of a collective rather than a solo pastor or something. Yeah, yeah. So they're attracted to to that, um, to, to Eastern Orthodoxy for the reasons you were saying and for the what I'm saying as well. Um, and, you, and to be honest, you can't blame them. It, it's a weakness. Because, I, you know, I think also, like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's opportunity in the Catholic Church. And in, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, I, I presume because they work on the liturgy and these cycles that there's also, there's opportunity in the Catholic. I know there's opportunity in the Catholic for midweek, going midweek to, to the Catholic Church to pray, to light candles. I assume it might be the same in the Eastern Orthodox yeah know. it is it is the same yeah like i went to a divine liturgy not so long ago because um i'm just researching eastern orthodoxy because i just realized how little i know about it and more and more people are like popping up who are eastern orthodox so i literally just sat at the back and took notes if you get what i mean but the one thing that i noticed that everyone was doing was one of the first things they did when they came in there'd be like um iconostasis i think they call it in the church where all the icons are and they would go up and light the candles in front of uh, the icons and say prayers to them and kiss said icons and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so I, I think that that uh, in in processing, you know, you go to church, you go to Bible, so you go to church, you come home, and then nobody's in contact with you through the week. And there's a, it's not like a, a life complete lifestyle, whereas. They've got all these things going on in the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox, like the streams that go on, the different prayer days and all the rest of it. That, I think, I think, I think what uh, draws people to Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism, and I will admit this is one of the things that did draw me to Catholicism, not particularly for an intellectual reason, but more, I would say, an emotional one, is the idea that the is the idea that there are parameters, boundaries, expectations when you go to church, for example. You know, yeah. when you end, when you enter the church, you kneel before the altar, make the sign of the cross, you know, that yeah. type of thing before you take your seat or, you know, what. And also you are expected to make your own prayers and confessions, um, you know, sat down in the pew before the mass has even started. These kind of things. Um, but the but the point is, the church tells you to do these things. And I think people kind of like that. They like the idea that the church is telling you you must do X, mm -hmm. Y and Z. Do you know what I mean? I think people like that. They, you know, th that note of authority. A kind of formal atmosphere. I've listened to, um, you know, Jay Dyer. Jay Dyer and uh, Orthodox Shahada and Seraph of Hamilton. I've been listening to them quite a bit the last six months. Um, I've listened to nearly all of Jay Dyer's debates, especially the ones on... Um, on uh, debating the Muslims. Um, and I kind of like, uh, I don't like uh, Jay Dyer's attitude. It can, I think he can be a, quite arrogant. Um, but I found uh, the way they deal with the Muslims sometimes, uh, I found uh, that apologetic, uh, I, I mentioned it, I've meant, I made a stream on it about creeds, Islamic creeds. Um, I found that very helpful, but I, I always laugh when he's attacking Calvinism because he likes to attack Calvinism. But when you listen to his life story, 
He wasn't really saved. He didn't really know the Lord when he's talking about Calvinism. You can tell. He doesn't really know what he's talking about. But when he's saying uh, we have the liturgy, uh, you don't have the liturgy, uh, but they uh, they have more books than we have. We have, the, you know, you you can see that that uh, it's like uh, off the wall, you know, Eastern Orthodoxy. <laughs> you can well, see but that. I've started what I've started to learn about Eastern Orthodoxy a bit. Roman Catholic, Roman Catholicism is very scholastic in the sense of they love to write everything down. Do you know what I mean? So all you really have to do is just pick up a Catholic catechism and find out what a Catholic believes. <laughs> That's all you yeah. have to do. Where, whereas, whereas Eastern Orthodoxy, it's a bit more mystical. You know, yeah. like uh, they don't they don't really have anything written down in any official kind of documents. They have the creeds, obviously but they they don't really have anything like a confession or a catechism it's just kind of passed down from one generation to the next the beliefs you know so it's a lot more mystical in that respect like um yeah. it's like for example in the catholic catechism it kind of goes you know god is say free in one for for this for x y and z reasons Whereas the, the Orthodox are much more comfortable to go oh it's a mystery how we just know that it is yeah, 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 <laughs> you yeah, know yeah. like um so so yeah, yeah but also in regards to dyer your um he is dry intellectualism and that's all he is like like yeah. there's no sort of there's no sort of like i've been watching a lot of the eastern orthodox guys dyer included recently yeah and that's yeah. my biggest that is my biggest critique of dyer is that he's just dry intellectualism i don't really hear him say oh you know i want you to become an eastern orthodox because i want you to be saved or something Whereas I've watched other yeah yeah that's orthodox, yeah. whereas I've watched other orthodox lads who are who are more that you know I want you to become orthodox because I want you to be saved. I can respect those guys because at least I feel like they're following their faith properly. Whereas yeah, Dyer yeah. just feels like Dyer just feels like dry intellectualism. That's all. That's all he is to me. But but I but uh, the I was listening to. Uh, Seraphim, I think it's Seraphim Hamilton. Uh, and uh, is it Seraphim I Rose? It, I know about Seraphim Rose. Uh, it might be Seraphim Rose. I, I thought it was Seraphim Hamilton, but Seraphim anyway. Um, and uh, and I think Jay Dyer has come to this conclusion, but I think it's a, a an official orthodox position is they don't go along with the modern textual criticism like the last ending of mark and things like that they don't take that position that it's not in the scripture so they they don't go along with whatever the prevailing academic view is on textual criticism about certain verses not in the gospel uh, not in the bible they 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 take a different the orthodox uh, look at it from a different angle on textual criticism with an angle that i i, I kind of go with I, I i i agree with you know i don't agree with the modern textual criticism the way they they go about it and stuff so that's one interesting um the other one is um the muslim apologetics they were on a show uh, i think it was last year and i was watching it about four days ago um i don't know what you think about this but uh, they were saying that on the servers the is it concord uh, uh, Discord, Discord, uh, Discord. Discord. <laughs> I keep calling it but uh, they were saying that they've been trying out some apologetic methods, and one of them, I don't know if you've tried this, but they, what, when the Muslim comes on, starting attacking the 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 uh, the deity of Christ or the the uh, Trinity, they were saying that one of the things they do is say, "Well, what's your akida? What's your creed?" And they say nine times out of ten, the Muslims don't know the creed. Not not just the Shahada, but there's a creed. There's the Sunnis, the different groups of Sunnis have a creed. The Shia have a creed. So if the if the Muslim says, "I don't know what my creed is," you say, "Well, what are you attacking the the Trinity for? You if you don't even know your own theology?" And then they were saying that that uh, the, most of these. I mean, you could correct this. You you'll know this more more than anyone. But uh, they were saying that most of the apologists online are salafi apologies i don't know um, if that's that is that somewhat true like sunni salafist kind of thing it's kind of like a half and half between the two 
Yeah, so they're not representative of the vast majority of Sunnis. So yeah, no, I don't no, know. they're not. That, that's not a that's not a bad apologetic method in a way. Um, but I guess my parting comment will be um, as I got to go to the bed in a bit. I've got work quite early in the morning, but um, but basically it would be that um, the other thing I will give the Orthodox Church a lot of credit for in its own way is I feel like even though I don't obviously think it's a false church and a false denomination, is it hasn't moved away from its roots at all. And that's something to be quite commended. They haven't really fallen into the trap of liberalism or it's, it's still quite a masculine church as well. So it's quite attractive for men. You know what I mean? Like, um, right, and, right. That is, and that is something that uh, really attracts these people to it. Do you know what I mean? Like they haven't, there might be like individual orthodox priests or individual orthodox churches you could point at and say they gone liberal but as a whole they haven't yeah you know i mean right. like um and um that is another thing that is drawing people to eastern orthodoxy i notice is they like the that they like they, the they like the fact is yeah the masculinity slash traditionalism right yeah you know i mean like like um they they haven't moved from their roots do you know i mean they they've stayed true to their roots as orthodox christians do you know what I mean? Like, and that is something to be kind of commended to a certain degree, even though I would say it's a false, false gospel and a false church. I can commend that to some degree. But I, I, uh, I attempted to read uh, Salamas as whatever. I can't remember, remember oh, his Palama, name. Palamas. Palamas. Gregory yeah, Palamas. Yeah. I, I attempted uh, about six months ago to read uh, the main text that they they appreciate in and it and it was hard going it's very very um it's very scholastic. philosophical it's very, very philosophical. philosophical yeah it was but also mysterious <laughs> and also mysterious <laughs> like uh, it's palamas, not easy reading palamas is where the essence energy comes from yeah you yeah know. so yeah, yeah. On, uh, that's another question can we uh I was look. I, I was reading the the the, the different groups of um, this. This dovetails into Calvinistic apologetics and just generally Christian apologetics as well. But I was I was reading um, the Sunni one of the Sunni creeds, um, and uh, in the in in the creeds they talk about uh, the Quran is is uncreated. Uh, one side of the Sunni uh, theological spectrum is they don't, the Salafis, they're all in a debate. I think it's the Afari or Atari or some group, the other side of the Sunnis. They don't believe that that you can, uh, you should be having these kind of debates. They believe like when you look at the language of uh, God as a hand, God as a feet, they, they say it's got to be, you've got to see it as literal, but only God knows what it means, you know. And they had they have debates even amongst themselves about the divine attributes. Are the divine attributes uh, part of the essence, separate from the essence? And it seems to me that in our theology, we have a doctrine of divine simplicity. That that there's a simpleness to God, so that the divine attributes are not dependent on the essence, but within the essence. There's a, the divine simplicity, whereas the Muslims, they're not very clear as to where the heck they stand on these things. I don't know what you think, but the no, big they're, debates on that. No, they're not. And also, and also, because I think the way that, you know, sort of, the way that philosophically God is described in Islam, you kind of, there is there seems to be somewhat a separation between the essence and the attributes yeah, whereas obviously yeah. where and and like that's the natural conclusion to kind of draw and it's the same actually for the essence energy as well <laughs> like right. um you know like um the same kind of principle is applied but obviously in divine simplicity we would say there is a little bit of a a little bit of a difference between what god is and what god does but just all those things are contained within god's essence they're not like separated off in any way like um 
because because then you run into the danger of turning God into parts like tritheism and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Can can you just unpack a little, just a little bit for us? When when the Orthodox say divine energies, what what are they saying? Like, what what is the teaching that they're actually saying? Because I, I when I've looked at it, I, I felt a bit uneasy about it. They're kind of saying that basically there is a difference between who God is and then what God does. So, like, um, so for right. example, God can't be loving until until God loves someone, or God can't be merciful until He shows mercy. They would say that God always had the ability to do these things. That's not what they don't. That's not what they don't say. If you get me, but they're basically right. saying God becomes loving the moment he loves someone or he becomes merciful the moment he is merciful to someone like um whereas in divine simplicity terms we would just kind of say that no god was always those things but there yeah. was a moment in time where where whereas there was but there was a moment in time where he displayed it maybe for the first time that that's um what we would say with divine simplicity that's basically what they're doing they're, they're kind of separating off who God is and what God does, because the energies, because here's the other thing, they believe that they can partake in the divine energies of God. So they can partake in the love of God. They can partake in the mercy of God. Do you get, do you get right? Because the essence yeah, to them yeah. is something that they can't experience or something they can't understand. But they think that the energy is something they can understand and something they can be partake in. So it, it's a kind of quasi mystical intellectualism in it, it rather than rooted in scripture yeah it very much is <laughs> and it also makes god really weird like like um because then you really are starting to turn god into like different parts you know yeah 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 i i i i I'll thank you for that clarification because i i looked into it a little bit i tried to read the palamas guy and it was doing me head in. I thought this is like quasi mystical intellectualism. Where, where's the scripture here? You know, I would, I would read someone like Seraphim Rose. He'll explain it to you a bit easier if you get me. Right, um, Seraphim Rose. Let's have a seat. Like, um, yeah, he'll explain it to you a bit easier. But like, that's the general idea. Is he on of YouTube? It. No, there's a good book of his. Um, I've forgotten what said book is called now because I borrowed it off someone and I've returned it. All to right, him. all right. Um, um, but uh, yeah, he it's about how he became an orthodox because he wasn't originally one and he goes into the um, okay. the whole essence energy. But yeah, it's like it's it's a weird way of just kind of trying to say, like, they, they, they'll admit that, like, yeah, God, God always had the ability, the way to view it is they'll be like. God always had the ability to be loving, they, so they don't deny that. But God doesn't become officially loving until he loves someone. That's the way to view, like, essence energy, basically. Wow. So they're up the creek without a paddle, mate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, um, whereas we would say God was always loving, but there might have been one point in time where he displayed it for the first time. Yeah, like I don't yeah. think we den I don't think we deny that there are moments in time where God displays His attributes, but it doesn't mean He wasn't them beforehand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, I was reading Voss before Dogmatics yesterday, and he was talking about uh, different ways of categorizing God's attributes, and he was talking about incommunicable and communicable, and then he talked about di uh, divine simplicity, and so he was saying all the attributes are there. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's fascinating that brother, and uh, appreciate your unpacking that a little bit for us about the, the divine energies and stuff, and putting it's on a, to us that it's, it's, really uh, it's a really weird, it's a really weird concept. It's a really weird concept. I got to be fair. <laughs> it's a really I, strange I, concept. I have a couple of books on Eastern Orthodoxy. I've got a book on the history of Eastern Orthodoxy. So I, I've read about half of it about the debates with the Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox on um, on the uh, the Trinity and the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Son and things like that. And also about how how the Eastern Orthodox had to live under the islamic rule and the, how difficult it was and um 
Oh, there's no doubt. There's no doubt they had it quite rough, didn't they? <laughs> there's no doubt about that. They yeah, had it quite yeah. rough, the Eastern Orthodox. And if I remember that a lot of their theologians, because Islam had taken over, and a lot of their theologians fled to, to Europe and they became quite immersed in Roman Catholicism. And uh, the Eastern Orthodox got a bit worried about that. So they, they started uh, their own seminaries and started to address the issue that a lot of their clergy were now influenced by uh, uh, Western theology. So those are the only things that I know. Uh, when I was at seminary, we were taken to an Eastern Orthodox church to look at the icons and things like that. And I've got a little book, and I don't know where it is, but it's by an Orthodox writer called Callistus Ware. And this issue of the mystery of God, like you were saying, comes out a lot. Like They like to talk about that there's an unknowability about God yeah it's like a good comparison would be in regards to how mystical the orthodox are once again the catholics are very scholastic so the you know right the the real presence of christ in the eucharist the catholics yeah. have a full have a full explanation for that the orthodox don't they just kind of go like yeah it is the real presence of christ like we don't know how it just is <laughs> like do you know what i mean like um and that's what i mean by that they that it's not the the orthodox are not a particularly scholastic tradition at all they they just kind of leave things up to like you know just god did it <laughs> we don't know how but god did it whereas the whereas the roman catholics are much more scholastic and they have they seem they seem to have an explanation for everything <laughs> that's great brother it's been great to talk to you it's been such a blessing brother that's <laughs> all right um you were talking about calvinism man i like talking about calvinism these days <laughs> so I, I think we've covered we could have gone to more scriptures i hope this helps a few people anyway just even if it's just a t couple of people um uh, and uh thank you so much for coming on brother i appreciate that and uh so folks uh we're going to go unless uh you want to ask any other questions or uh some of you want to say anything um if anybody wants to come on Veco, we miss you, bro. You could have come on, mate. Where have you? Where are you? I bet you're at work or something, but you could have come on, bro. I guess my final parting comment would just simply be at uh, certainly back to take it back to the reformed faith now. Would be yeah. that people need to investigate the reformed faith, what the claims are of the reformed faith for themselves, rather than go off people like Flowers or Shamoon. And really understand what we are what we are trying the kind of claims we are trying to make like so, um like because there's a lot of misinformation about calvinism now from people like Leighton flowers and from people like sam shamoon there's a lot a lot of misinformation about what how we understand the scripture and it's like no just you know I, I, my objective in life is not to make someone a calvinist my objection is to my my sorry my objective even is to is to just simply make them a christian they can work they can work out the reform things and stuff for for themselves uh, like you know yeah, like yeah. um but but this is not this you know things like things like issues in regards to the providence and and sovereignty of god is very much a secondary issue you and me jason could be wrong on this we could be completely wrong on this i don't think we are but we could be completely wrong on this and I, but I don't think that affects our standing with the Lord whatsoever. Do you know what I mean? So you need we when when say someone like Bob, for example, says you know what's primary and what's secondary. This would be a secondary issue and a and a debate amongst in in-house believers, in my opinion. Mm. So how but, how would you um, if someone's out there and and uh, there's all this bad information? fake fake news fake information misinformation about calvinism how what what would you suggest what road to go on like to investigate how 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 would you encourage someone who's listening now to find out for themselves about these things like what what would you recommend like any and any way forward like what would you recommend the first way forward i would suggest would be try and find out where where do uh the reformed tradition get their ideas from that's the bible right so 
try and try and look into what does the Bible say in regards to predestination? What does it say? You know, and then and but then after that, I would also say because a, no, a common objection is that say we we believe what say Calvin says, but then again, I don't actually think a lot of people actually understand say someone like John Calvin. They seem to misunderstand the man and they seem to misunderstand what he was trying to say. <laughs> so it'd be like, go and read, go and read someone like Calvin for yourself and make your own conclusions based on that. Like, do you know what I mean? You can't like, like, uh, you remember back in my Catholic days, I used to be very critical of Calvinism, didn't I? Um, yeah. but it wasn't until I actually read Calvin myself that I realized what the man was trying to say. You know, and he, and he wasn't trying to make God into some sort of evil puppet master. He was just trying to he was just trying to make God almighty and powerful and sovereign. That's all Calvin's trying to do. Like, mm. um, so, yeah, those are the two things I'd recommend. W look into what does the Bible say about predestination? That's the starting point. But then after that, why don't you look at people like Calvin or people uh light like by being and stuff and realize what they're actually trying to say rather than trying to assume what they're trying to say so so would you encourage someone to read calvin's institutes then oh totally it's one of the best it's one of the best works i think a christian any christian ever ever put pen to paper in my opinion and and bavink's written um a couple of smaller theology books um are very simple and easy to read. If anybody wants to read something like a bit more lighter, uh, he wrote a systematic theology, but more like just just very simple. Um, it's got a funny name to it, but uh, I'll put a link to it. I'll, when that next stream I do, I'll put a link to it. Um, yeah, um, it's a very simple theology book. But yeah, uh, read Spurgeon's sermons, listen to Lloyd-Jones sermons uh, on various key topics. Um, you can go to Monogism, Sermon Audio. Those are places where you can the, find out about the Reformed faith. Or the Reformed up, Confessions. Know, the Reformed yeah. Confessions are very good as well. Like. <laughs> yeah, pick up the 1689 Baptist Confession. You can get them at uh, the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, 1689 Baptist Confession or the Westminster Confession, uh, Exposition of the Westminster Confession by A. A. Hodge, Exposition of the Westminster Confession by uh, Shaw. These are superb books. Uh, another book that you could get hold of, which I recommend anybody and anybody doing ministerial training, a modern exposition of the 1689 Baptist Confession by uh, Samuel E. Waldron, Evangelical Press, uh, the, Westminster, uh, the 1689 Baptist Confession. That's the one so I got, actually, you, the second one. Would you, you close had? in prayer, brother, then, if you, unless you've got anything else you want to ask or say? No, so, uh, the last thing I was going to say, yeah, the, the confessions, because they put it very simply and very clearly, like uh, what the Reformed faith is. But also I think a lot of people misunderstand I'd like to add this actually there's more to the reformed faith than just the predestination side of it if yeah. you read like if you read like the confessions it's like you'll notice that everything knits together and it's a whole system of theology there's a bit more to it than we just simply believe in the predestination side of things like that's brilliant like, yeah. like to me people who because this you know when I say I said earlier I'll just quickly say this when 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 I said earlier that there are people online who say that they're Calvinists, but they're defining Calvinist by just believing in predestination. Right. And it's like, no, and it's like, no, there, there's more to it than that. Like, yeah. um, like, you know, like, um, say for example, in the confessions, uh, it talks about the, the, you know, the, the sort of reform view of the sacraments would be like the, you know, they are signs and symbols, but they're not just empty signs and symbols. And through your faith, they 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 do have means of grace within them. Mm. You know, what I mean, like um, and things like this. You know, so it's like there is more to the reformed faith than just simply 
believing in like if you believe in predestination you're not really reformed you're just agreeing with one part of it <laughs> in my opinion yeah, you're just yeah. you're just agreeing with one bit of it <laughs> there's a whole raft of theological other issues like the doctrine of justification regeneration sanctification the trinity uh inspiration of scripture uh the divine decrees marriage there's all when you say reformed theology like you're saying it's not just predestination but to hang it all together it's rooted in we're, we're saying a god-centered theology rather than man-centered theologies we look into glorify god as as a sovereign god but it's a good point you're making because people just get this thing about predestination and they forget the richness of what's going on here there's a lot more to this than meets the eye just have a look at it look at the confessions and you'll find that um there's a lot to learn and grow you might not agree with everything but there's a lot there that you can help you grow in the faith and grow in christ amen to that so that's a good point to make brother um would you please be pleased to close in prayer brother yeah of course yeah of course dear lord almighty we thank you for this day and we also thank you for any blessings that we might have received today that we might be unaware of and we might have missed and we and also lord i pray for jason that his uh, ministry in africa will go well and also that you'll encourage him and uh, give him your grace and give him the ability to speak soundly that but also that it would not be for his glory it be for your glory i also pray for what myself and john have been up to recently in regards to our attack of the uh, the, uh, the ecumenical movement and that you might use us for your glory and not uh, and not for ours as well yeah. and lord we pray that people will come to understand uh the reformed faith in regard not that they might become one but just that this division that is being caused by some people may cease to exist and we can actually exist as brothers and sisters in christ yeah. rather than be put into camps like calvinist and non-calvinist uh we pray all this in the name of your might, mighty son jesus christ amen 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 bro thanks sam amen. appreciate you coming brother i'm gonna go and get my my tea so, uh it's that time of day it's that time of day is it mate? <laughs> all right brother <laughs> thanks for thanks for coming and hope to see you again soon brother god bless love Take to care. john as well and Arul if you ever meet him will do mate will do thanks very much all right uh john god mac bless. Gideon, Sam, everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, Veckel, Stephen, uh, Pastor Richard, Elijah, Mike, everybody, hope you found this a blessing. And uh, God bless you and take care now. God bless you.